Commonwealth's attorneys and I have concluded that the NCAA sanctions were overreaching and unlawful. Someone's got the bubble product, and you and I, I'm sure, are going to want to buy. The country needs a comprehensive energy. Welcome to another edition of For the Record. You know, we've had a lot of candidates sit across from me. We've had elected officials that have been in office for a long time. Today, something different. Freshman House member Tommy Sankey from the 74th District. Tommy, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Steve. Let's let ever you introduce yourself to everybody. Let's talk about Tommy Sankey before last November. Talk about your background a little. Uh, I come from a family business. I went to college to be an accountant. I'm not much of a pencil pusher. I thought I wanted to be an accountant. I really just wanted to be self-employed. Ran the family business. I'm a crane operator by trade. And you got into the, uh, decided to run for the 74th last year. What was the reasoning behind that? Uh, I'm in effect of government. I think we, uh, we have a spending problem. We have a debt problem. And I think it's time for everyday people to stand up and say enough's enough. I consider myself a citizen legislator and uh, perhaps maybe even a statesman. Now, you've been elect you were just elected in November. You've got sworn in on no New Year's Day. What was that kind of experience like for you? Uh, it wasn't much of a New Year's Eve party. Uh, we, it was exciting, though, because we got to start on the first day of the year. And I'd, I'd seen the Capitol as a kid. I'd never really been through the Capitol. And you, you sit on that floor, and it's amazing. And the fact that you get to be part of this whole celebration. And I, just, I, was, I probably don't remember much of it because it was, so much was new, and I was just taking it all in. Now, what's been the biggest surprise so far for you uh, in a positive way since you've been elected? Um, a lot of people have reached out. Uh, a lot of people even across the aisle there seems to be such a division between R's and D's anymore. And uh, I'm, I've proposed a bill that uh, local representative Mike Hanna wanted to run and, and con reached out to me and said, hey, I have a bill that would be good for you and be good for me. And if you read it over and think maybe it's something you're interested in, he said, uh, how about you run it and put me as the first co-sponsor. So a lot of people, a lot of senior members even from the other side have reached out and to the new members and you know kind of indoctrinated us into the system and made it easier, made an easy transition. Now is there an orientation for new house members? Yeah, they teach us so much, they give us so much information we have no idea what's going on. They, uh, they give us about a two hour crash in the computer system and uh, I, I really didn't know. I asked a lot of questions. Uh, Matt Gobbler and I share a secretary and we're, we're good friends uh, outside of this and he's just been a tremendous uh, person to lean on and really help, help me out tremendously. Now what a lot of people don't realize is you were sworn in in January but he actually started working in December of yeah. last year and what are the types of things you have to do to get your run up before you're swearing in? Um, you run feverishly trying to get uh, lease assigned, trying to hire staff and you get a lot of people that are, that are inquiring and it's, it's, it's a couple jobs in the area and it's a good job with good benefits and people, I, had a lot of, I got so many resumes I had to forward them to Harrisburg to have them screen through. I, I didn't know how else to do it and you know where I come from in my world uh, when you were hiring someone you're looking for someone with a commercial driver's license and a reliable transportation to get to work. Um, and in that arena, I was looking for something different, looking for people that, that had great people skills that, that were, were, were meticulous in paperwork, and, and I didn't really know what, exactly what I was looking for. Found some young people and uh, some people, a uh, fellow that's a little bit older, and you know, every one of my, two of my staffers have MBAs, and one of them is a school teacher that couldn't find a job, so they're very well educated, and they've just been fantastic. Have you had any negative uh, surprises yet since you've been elected? You know, you always have a few of those. Uh, I, get, I get a lot of nasty mail. Not a lot, but uh, surprisingly. And I, and I take that stuff personal. And I guess you, you have to, if you don't have thick skin when you start, you have alligator skin when you're done. And, uh, but I, but I, take them, I take the letters and I read them and I write them in response myself. I don't want somebody else to do it. When I have people that are angry, I, I talk to them. And I, and I, it's more of miscommunication than anything. And people kind of uh, you know, believe what they hear, not what they read. So is it more of like a frustration with government in total and you're just the, the person they pick to reach out to? Um, I'm the, they say it is the house, you're, you're the closest to the constituents. So, um, you know, we were in, well, my family's been in business for 60 years, so a lot of my phone calls, uh, they come to my cell phone because people know me and they can't reach anyone else and a lot of times they need to reach Congressman Thompson, but they call me because they say, hey, I know you know him. Mm -hmm. And you, you just got to lead them, you got to lead people to water and it's, it's, it's a shame that we can't streamline things better and you go through situations where people are calling Harrisburg and people are, people are calling specific departments and can't get an answer and, and can't get a straight answer. They call us, uh, we field the call and make the necessary required changes, whatever they need, 
and, and we can streamline it. And it's, it's kind of a shame that it has to be that five-step process, but it's, it's the most effective system. Too. Now, where are your district offices located? I have one uh, on the far east corner of the county, Osceola Mills, um, in, in the back of uh, the Osceola Mills Library. So it kind of effectively works out for them and, and me. And then I have one in Clearfield, in the borough of Clearfield, uh, 315 East Market Street. Now you have a unique situation because your district butts up with Speaker Smith and you're also within the senatorial district to the President Pro Tem Joe Scarnati. Do you feel any extra pressure based on who's, you know, in there in sharing your same territory? Hey, I, uh, I like it. I would rather have the Speaker of the House as your neighbor and the Senate Pro Temp as part of your district. I, um, a lot of the other half of my district is, is John Wozniak, and in, in my section where I specifically live, um, the 35th uh, Senatorial District, and, and John Wozniak's a great guy too, and, and he's on the other side of the aisle, and he's someone you can ask questions to, and he'll give you a straight answer. People really like him in the area, and, and Joe and Sam have been the same way. You know, I would... I, I don't think they're per se I get any favoritism but you know essentially there's a lot more representatives from Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and, and we've got the two top guys from you know, western central Pennsylvania it's kinda nice to have them there. Now does the house do anything with a mentoring program with new members where they you sort of work with one of the senior uh, people within the, the house as well in your, in your caucus? I don't think uh, on the record I don't think but I, I gotta give them credit you know there was nine of us freshmen the secretary Mike Verb has gone above and beyond what I would consider the call of duty getting us getting us up to speed Mike Terzai has been great uh, Sam has been great you know and whereas they know us all personally we were on they called all our cell phones uh, you know nearly oh, nearly everyone in leadership uh, before we even got started you know in December after after we got elected they were they were on the phone with us all the time making sure they they asked what our legislative priorities were where we see ourselves in 10 years what we you know what you want to see happen while you're here and, and and you know just getting to know you personally and what you stand for and I got to give them a lot of credit because you you don't feel as though you're not welcome you don't feel as though you should be nervous you can walk into Speaker Smith's office and I, I walk in and start eating the candy out of the out of the dish you know and and you, you get a straight answer. Everybody's so nice and so open. It, it made it really nice, really easy transition. That's a good spot for us to stop. When we come back, let's talk more about the process of where things are going in the legislative session with Tommy Sankey, 74th District House member. Back with more on WHVL right after this. Welcome back to For the Record. Our guest today is newly elected House member Tommy Sankey. Representative Sankey, um, it's funny to say that, Tommy. Uh, <laughs> what committee assignments were you given this year? Um, I was uh, selected to be on environmental resources and energy, local government, uh, children and youth, and commerce. I'm the okay. Secretary of Commerce. Now, what is your role with the Commerce Committee within the House? I don't know what the Secretary does. I signed the papers. I, I wanted to get on it because of economic development uh, locally. Alan Walker is the Secretary of DCED. Right. Uh, I, I thought it was an offer, opportune time to get involved in commerce. Uh, Clearfield County has 9.6 percent unemployment. Um, I, anything I can do to, to help bring any industry to the area, we have to. Talked about energy. That's a big thing, especially Marcella Shale and, and natural gas. Um, I was on the road on 322 the other day, got to be behind a lot of trucks. What kind of activity has changed since Marcella Shale has come to your region? A lot of trucks. You know, I saw it as a personal boost. Our business, we were in the crane and hauling business, and uh, we nearly doubled our workforce when it got big, 08, 09. And uh, I, I had never been in a position living in, in central Pennsylvania where there was such an influx of money if you were willing to work for it. And it wasn't easy work, and, and it wasn't cut and dry, and, and it wasn't always steady. But I think it is the future. It has to be done right. It has to be done with the environment uh, first and foremost. But you know, this is this is a cleaner energy, and we are sitting on the second largest pocket of gas on the globe. The world's in an energy crisis, and we have it. We we've got to champion it. Now, with your area, uh, there's been a lot of discussion in Harrisburg for a couple years about severance tax versus local impact fee, mm -hmm. and uh, the governor went with the local impact fee mm -hmm. rather than the severance tax. Have you seen a benefit, has your district seen a benefit yet from that local impact tax on in the area yes, from that? Yes, a lot. And, and it's helped. It's helped with a lot of budgets. Lawrence Township got, got a good chunk of money. I'm not spe specific how it was, but it was I think it was close to half a million dollars. But a lot of small townships got a, got a chunk of money. And, and as they should. I mean, the impact is here. The roads are being destroyed here. The If there's any damage done, it's going to be done here. I, I think it, it's great that everybody can enjoy it, everybody can, can benefit from it, but realistically the, the drilling side of it and the, the clearing for, for pads and things like that, that's happening in our backyard and 
these you know, small communities, they, they don't have a lot of money, and that's where the money should stay. Well, with the 9.2% unemployment, certainly the opportunities are going to be there for uh, new yeah. employment to come in, also new people to come into the area. Is that a, talk about that as a benefit, economic? Driving. I mean, they're they're going to drill for well, we figure at least 25 to 35 years. And I and I've reached out to several companies and trying to get more information because a lot of the things we hear are as a result of lack of knowledge. And uh, I, I think it's more important that we. The, the drilling is going to, to be here for a while, but there's a lot of other aspects. And if we have this gas and we're running through this gas, we can attract manufacturing. There are so many spin-off products that come as a result of natural gas. We can heat our homes cheaper, energy is cheaper, infrastructure is going to be more readily accessible as a result of this. And the sky's the limit. It doesn't end with just drilling. And I've seen it from a lot of my own friends that have, have gone on, and they've had to travel some, don't get me wrong. but. When you're at home and you're struggling and you're looking for a $10 an hour job and someone offers you an opportunity that you're going to work hard, but you, you're going to make $80,000 this year, you know, the, the people are, are embracing it, and I think they should. Now, in the Commerce Committee itself, uh, the makeup is both Democrats and Republicans, mm -hmm. correct? And is that a regional thing, or is it uh, widespread members from both all areas? It, of the It's area? from all over, and, and it's it's a good mix because you have you have Republicans and Democrats both from rural and urban areas and you know we're, we're an area here where we're we're building small industrial parks we want to invite businesses to be in here and which it ties in with gas and and it's a little bit different perspective from people who are in a, a much larger area commerce means maybe something a little bit different to them than it does to us but you know what we're all competing we all want jobs we all want the same thing the path sometimes a little bit different but the end result is the same thing now you talked about you wanted to get on to the commerce committee that was one of the ones you asked to be on how what is the who sets the assignments for your committees is that done through uh, um, leadership I in leadership, Mike, Mike yeah. I, or is or is that predetermined based on region? Uh, no, no. And I mean, maybe that plays into it. But you know, Sam and Mike, uh, Sam being the speaker, Mike being the majority leader, and I'm sure a lot more of the leadership has a say in it. But they get a feel for everybody. And, and you know, I I was put on ERE, Environmental Resource and Energy, because we're in a Marcellus area. Uh, coal has been big, and Pennsylvania is the fourth largest coal producing state in the nation. So these are things that, that Sam felt being my neighbor, hey, this is important. My predecessor was at one time the chairman of the Environmental Committee. So, and, and though the committee's changed a little bit in what it does because it encompasses energy now, but, but it's important to do so. But no, it's just a mix. And, and they, uh, I, I, don't quote me, I want to say the speaker chooses the, the chairs of the committee, and then I think leadership works together to assign those committees, and it's a good mix. Sure. Local government, uh, what types of things are you going to look at on that uh, for this next term? That's the key. Good governments, local government, that's where it starts at home. And uh, uh, Representative Benninghoff just got a bill through there, and uh, it was, it, it's different because you see a lot of, uh, you see a, a different angle of government there, and, and it basically deals a lot with um, well, you know, in my my situation, I feel like I'm I'm lobbying for municipalities and boroughs because I want the people to have their own their own freedom because they they see it on the ground and, and no different than a borough council or or uh, township supervisors. Those are some of the toughest jobs that anybody can have, and they're thankless. And and I want to be able to speak for them because we have a lot. We have a lot of we have a lot of small municipalities that are struggling in my district, and I, and I want to be able to try to present them and give them their own identity. Children and youth, what types of things are you going to look at this year on that on that committee? Well, seeing as how I don't have any children, it was, that was different. But uh, nonetheless, it's still a lot of things are coming up with education, uh, safety, and, and nobody nobody's going to question anything. Those a lot of bills have gone through at least uh, second and third considerations for uh, safety in schools, safety of children. A lot of things come up with uh, Jerry Sandusky case. You know, these are all things that we've now formed a precedent, and, and that includes Sandy Hook. So. We're really not leaving any stone unturned when it comes to children's safety, and I think it should be because no, nobody can really stand up and say, oh, the children will be okay because at some point it's your school or it's your neighborhood, and, and, and it's important that we identify predators and we lock them up and don't let them back out. Now, what is one of the things that you yourself want to achieve in this legislative term in terms of uh, some sort of legislation? Um, I am... I've proposed the manufacturing bill, a uh, uh, bill for transparency in DEP so that the people who are paying fines can see where their money is going, and w which is something I didn't even realize. I put out a, uh, a, a tax, an air tax credit for coal companies, or for at least power plants to, to help those coal companies. I, I want to see us be a more 
open environment for business. I feel like we have, well, we have the second highest corporate net income tax at 9.9% uh, next to Iowa's top tier. And, and essentially, it's more red tape and regulation. I, I bring it from a small business perspective, and, and I think we're killing the little man, and people don't want to be in the business, and we're, we're killing innovation, and we've got to open up our doors and be much, much more friendly to businesses and, and encourage them to want to come to Pennsylvania, not Delaware, not Ohio. You know, it's, it's competitive, and whether it's fair or not, that, that's not my place to decide. I just know we have to compete because we're losing on that. Okay, that's a good stopping point for us. Back with more For the Record right after this on WHVL. Welcome back to For the Record. Our guest is Representative Tommy Sankey. Tommy, let's talk about some of the hot topics in Harrisburg right now. First Great. and foremost, privatizing the Pennsylvania lottery. The governor was in favor of it. The attorney general uh, on the Democratic side doesn't like it. Where do you stand on the issue? Well, this could take a while. Um, I'll, I'll give you a brief version. I, I didn't like the delivery. I, I, I'm not here to ever criticize the governor, but I felt as though he, he should open it up a little bit more and sold it to the public better. And uh, our lottery is a very profitable lottery. We have a good lottery. The issue being there's 10,000 people a day in this country that qualify for Medicare. Now, they don't all live in Pennsylvania, but those same people will qualify for senior services in our state. And though our lottery is very profitable and very good compared to others, it's not solvent for the future. And whether it's Meals on Wheels, or senior services, senior centers, um, rent rebate, there's a lot of programs out there that run on the lottery that the money doesn't have to come out of the general fund. And I think what Governor Corbett was trying to do, which he didn't do a good job of in terms of selling it, was trying to keep these programs solvent without raising taxes. And it was, it kind of happened really fast and everybody got really upset. But if you sit down and look at the numbers of how, what they were trying to do, uh, it's not a bad idea. I just wish that we would have ran it through the General Assembly so we could have tore it apart and taken out what we didn't like and put in what we did like, just like the budget, and sent it through, and it could have been ours, and we could have went and sold it to our districts. Staying on privatization, let's talk about the liquor stores. Well, it's just us in Utah now that the state runs the liquor business. And, and, and there's, there, there's some parts of this bill uh, coming up, too, that, that I don't necessarily agree with, but I think it's time to get out of the liquor business. This is a... This is a giant leap for people who do believe in limited government. Um, it, it's time. It's time for selection. It's time for convenience. And, and there, there, there's going to be some blowback from it, but we, we've waited so long. Um, we, we are getting destroyed around the borders by every state around us has privatized liquor. And, and whether you're in Sharon or you're in the southeast, uh, people are crossing the border to buy their alcohol. And, and it's a simplified system. We're outdated. Let's, let's, ma let's streamline it. Let's, let's get the government out of it, and it'll make it more convenient. It'll make it more efficient. It'll make it better. And it's something else that we're taking the government out of. Transportation, one of the things that the governor has talked about, he had two studies done on it. Uh, both sides of the aisle, both chambers, Senator Corman, Senate, uh, Representative Hanna, both talked about it, uh, making things about infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Where do you see, especially in your district, with the amount of trucks that are going on yeah. there with Interstate 80, what types of things do you want to see uh, changed for the transportation funding? Uh, it's 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 top notch priority. It is without question, uh, and and we're not certain where all the money's going to come from. We hope that it's going to work out. And, um, the roads and bridges need updated, everything. We're hard on things, and we live in an area where the roads don't freeze all winter, and, but they do freeze some days, and, and expansion contraction. We're hard on them, the trucks are hard on them. Um, it's, it's difficult for everybody, I, but I think it needs to be at the top of the list. I mean, we, we, are, we live in an area that we're gonna have to work on the roads. We're gonna work on the roads every year, no matter what. And, and you just locally, like Hawbakers, I know they have over 400 people laid off waiting on a transportation bill. These people spend an awful lot of money in fuel taxes that go directly to paving those roads and fixing those bridges. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of money being taken out of those systems to, to uh, subsidize rail, and I know that. And, and rail's important, but, but I think there's ways that we can be more efficient. But it's going to be a lot of money, and it's got to be looked at very seriously because there is going to come a point where we're going to have a, an issue like Minnesota. When we have a bridge fall and lives are lost. You have two huge ones in your district, those two viaducts are in Interstate 80. On 80. And we can't, aside from the safety issue, which, which is top priority, 
we can't withstand the financial impact of trucks having to be rerouted on township roads because we have bridges closed. You know, the studies have been done. It's, it's in the millions, and I mean quick. And, and we can't combat the time frame of raw materials in, finished product out for, for anywhere that, that rely on these roads. And we have a lot of roads, but it's, it's got to be a top priority. You serve for rural Pennsylvania. What are the things that local governments are hit with most are the cost of police? Uh, agencies. The state police, uh, they're getting new cadets right now, but the right. funding source for state police has always been an issue. What are your thoughts on that with rural Pennsylvania that you represent? It's, it's, it's a big issue because it's tough too for us because we, we have state police barracks uh, locally. We have one in Woodland, we have one in Phillipsburg, but I feel as though the state police are, are investigating a lot of crimes that should be taken care of by a local police force because we, you know, they're, they're essentially highway patrol as well because their money, their funding comes from fuel taxes and the, the cost of many of our small communities at home, all these boroughs, they don't have any police at all. And, and you're essentially asking the state police to be going to into these communities to deal with domestic disputes that is 25, 35 miles away. And, and it really isn't the state police's job, but they have to do it because we need a police. And, and it's, a, it's, it's an easy answer to say, we'll take them out of the motor fund, but then how are we gonna pay for them? And, and that's the catch 22 we're in. I would rather see, and I'm talking about something bigger like most states, uh, where the sheriff handles most of this and, and we could do it by county and yeah it's going to put more money uh, being spent on the county level but we're, we're pulling guys off of the highways to be dealing with domestic disputes that that really that isn't their jurisdiction but they're servicing us because they made a commitment to service the community but I, I think the system needs to be performed. What was the last book you read? <laughs> well yesterday I read the real uh, story behind the three little pigs. That's well, why I asked the question. <laughs> from the wolf's point of view which I think is a little bit of propaganda. I, I think it was a little bit biased. Uh, other than that. I, and, and you should read that to a group of school children. We should clarify that. That wasn't just what you read for, <laughs> for anything at Harrisburg. Yeah and they told me I had wrinkles in my eyes and my hair was getting gray. <laughs> I said, come on. Uh, Conservative Victory by Sean Hannity. Um, I was just in, in, intrigued by it. I, you know, I don't necessarily read a lot of political books, but uh, it was one that was suggested to me by my older brother, and he reads a lot. And There's a lot I have to read. I've got about 25 books that people have given me that I need to read. But Excellent. Representative Sankey, thank you very much for being a part of the show, and I look forward to having you back when you're a seasoned uh, legislator in a year or two. Uh, it's, it's an absolute honor to be here with you, Steve Miller. Thanks for doing the show. Thanks for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.